Hello. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us here today. It's a great pleasure for me to be here with Harrison. Uh, Notion Capital is a venture capital firm. We are based in London. I'm Ichasso. I'm one of the partners there. I joined them uh, four years and a half ago. And it was uh, early after our investment in Parel uh, when I, I joined Notion. So I've been very close to, to Harrison since, um, since I joined them. And I, I invited him to come to Madrid. I'm based in London, but as you already figured out, I'm Spanish. <laughs> uh, I've been there for, for 14 years, but I still have this uh, strong accent. Um, and we're going to be talking about data and AI, which I think is a hot topic today. Everyone wants to talk about <laughs> that. So Harrison, uh, why don't you do a quick introduction of yourself and, and, and Padel, mm -hmm. and, um, and then we're going to talk about data and AI. Cool. Firstly, thank you for having me. Uh, it's my first time in Madrid, first time at South Summit. We've got music, everyone has loads of energy, super warm. So thank you so much for having me, maybe, maybe just to start with. Um, so yeah, I'm Harrison. Uh, I co-founded my first company, Paddle, about 10 years ago. Um, we're 300 staff, uh, um, employees all over the world, customers all over the world, U Europe, US, China. Um, we've raised over $200 million. Um, our most recent fundraise uh, coined us like a unicorn, whatever that means in, in today's market. Um, I ran all of revenue, go-to-market and strategy uh, for Paddle for the last 10 years. Um, I stepped back from a full-time role uh, in January last year, which was terrifying, having run the company for my entire adult life. Um, I was meant to take a long break and spend more time in lovely places like Madrid, um, but wasn't so good at that uh, and ended up joining another company called Goodfit, which is actually born out of a lot of the cool things we were doing with data uh, at Paddle, launched by my old head of RevOps, and it's kind of what we'll talk a little bit about today. So that, that's the background, if that makes sense. Excellent. So why don't you tell us, in fact, um, I know you used a lot of data, you set up data processes within, within Paddle. Tell us a little bit more about that. How were you using data and what were you doing with that? Sure. I mean, data was super critical for us from day one, maybe to give you some context. Um, Paddled as revenue infrastructure for software companies. So think like payments, taxes, fraud, checkout, things of that nature. Um, but when we first started the company, literally nobody knew who we were. Nobody knew what revenue infrastructure was. I'm not sure we really did at the start, given it was like category creating. Um, people were building software in very different ways to how we thought about it. And I realized quite quickly was that unless we went out and, and solicited and, and, and seeked out customers ourselves, we were just going to win no, no business. Um, and data was a really critical part of how we did that. I often talk about how we used data and the early RevOps team that we built out as one of the secret sources behind kind of the, the growth that we had in the early days that we can, we can talk about. But what I recognized quite quickly was no software companies were coming to me, so I had to go and find them. So I tried to map the market of every single software company in the world, given that's who we were targeting. And that's a lot easier said than done. We'll talk about how we use um, text-based machine learning and, and AI to actually help us with that uh, maybe a little bit later. But having mapped the market of every software company, I then realized there were like tens of thousands of them. And I had a team of like three or four people. And I was like, OK, so this isn't super useful. I can't target all of these people all at once. So then we started gathering huge amounts of data and context on every single software company uh, globally. At one point, we were calling it the software universe, but that, that stopped after a while. And the data we collected on these companies would probably look different to the types of data you'd collect on the market you're targeting. But we were interested in things like what payment providers were they using, what percentage of international traffic were they getting, what currencies did they support, who were they hiring in their open job descriptions, were they talking about cross-border tax, really specific stuff that we as, in we as Paddle were super interested in. And then having gathered all of that context on every single software company in the market, we were able to prioritize those companies that look most likely to buy. So I could basically focus my efforts on that lowest hanging fruit. I wanted to target the customers with the highest sales velocity, um, the best conversion rates in the funnel, given that I had a very limited pool of resources to actually throw at winning some business. Um, so using all of this data, um, we went outbound. Email was our only channel, actually, for, for five years, targeting those customers that look most likely to buy. We were growing at 300% year on year for those first five years. Um, and data as a, as a core, I guess, still is the, the fundamental starting point for every go-to-market decision that the business still makes. In fact, investors were almost as interested in what we were doing with data at every single one of our fundraisers as they were Paddle itself, um, which was a little bit distracting. Um, but I know 
you guys are doing some similar stuff, so that, that could be why. I don't know if you want to talk about how VCs are doing something similar to target their portfolio companies, maybe. Yeah, definitely. So it looks like you were, in fact, looking at potential customers in yep. the market, gathering data about those and identifying the ones who were, in fact, your ideal customer profile, reaching out to those, right? So in our case, um, Notion Capital, we have, in fact, we use data for our sourcing to uh, we've built a proprietary tool internally. We have two developers in the team uh, internally, and we are uh, basically tracking some, some signals in the market. We track when uh, people from very fast-growing businesses leave those businesses and either put something like a stealth mode on their LinkedIn profiles or um, founder of a new business, we track angel investors all over the world. We have lo long list of founders of angel investors. We track where are they investing, where are they becoming um, advisors. And so that brings us a big deal flow across Europe that we can target. And then we use that again to prioritize those because obviously we do have a venture analyst team that reaches out to those companies. We are a SaaS investor and we, we basically treat our pipeline as a SaaS company. So we have venture analysts who do the SDR role and take the top of the funnel and start reaching out to those. So basically we are applying the same things that we tell our companies in SaaS to do, we do the same thing with our pipeline um, as an investor. Mm -hmm. That's what we are using. But that is using data. I think the next step is about learning from the data ourselves um, at Notion. We haven't started to use AI on top of that. But I think you guys ha mm -hmm. were using also artificial intelligence on top of that, on top of that data, right? Yeah, and we were doing so quite, quite early, actually, at least in a basic way. And maybe to give you the context as why, so um, paddle target software companies, um, and even more specific than that, we had to target software companies that had a checkout because it was a lot of the tooling around the checkout that we actually supplied. And they're actually in the minority in the software world, which is kind of wild. Most people are like sales led, selling to enterprises with high ACVs. Um, and it's really, really tough to actually identify companies that those things are true for. If you ever go to something like LinkedIn and try and filter for like software as a category, like you get so many false positives, like software development agencies, for example, as well as false negatives, like Hootsuite, the big social media automation tool, lists themselves as like advertising services, so we wouldn't pick those up. Um, so that was one challenge. The next is then trying to identify within that who is using a checkout is even harder. People use things like technographics, which is like which technologies a company is using in order to identify maybe if they're, in our case, they were using a checkout, but coverage there is poor because sometimes technologies are behind like login panels, um, which are very difficult to scrape and crawl. This was a really big challenge for us. And the way I solved it at first was very stupidly, we just hired eight full-time people in central London called lead development reps who are just trying to kind of clean and mangle this, these sets of data into something useful for us, um, which was incredibly expensive and maybe not the best call. Um, but then we started to use AI to actually solve that problem after a while. So specifically, natural language processing. Um, what NLP is quite good at is like classification. So. If a human is able to like look at a website, read it, do a bunch of research, and then categorize that company, the thing that they've just been researching, that website as group A or group B, natural language processing and NLP, uh, NLP is pretty good at replicating that, basically. So we manually labeled thousands of software companies and non-software companies uh, to train one model, and then separately we, we had another bunch of data that we labeled as uh, either like checkout software companies or sales assisted only check uh, software companies as we called them. And we trained these models to predict whether a, a company we were targeting was indeed a software company. And then latterly, whether it was a sales assisted only or a checkout based software company. It was basically just taking all of the text from their homepage, uh, processing it and then spitting out a probability as to whether it was indeed a software company or one of the checkout companies we cared about. And we got those to like and we still use them today, good fit my new company now, supplies them to paddle, and to like 90% accuracy, which was actually more accurate than the humans we had doing it. And I guess they were just suffering from like lethargy or human error. Um, but even more importantly, we were able to process 
huge numbers of, of companies all, all at once as opposed to just, just a handful. So that was our kind of first stab at it, using NLP to, to classify those companies uh, that we were trying to sell to in the first place. Because without having mapped map that market as the first stage in that um, kind of go-to-market process, it's very difficult to then prioritize within it or decide who you're going to go after. So that's how we started to use it and continue to use it today, quite frankly. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. I think, um, obviously, all the examples that we are talking about are related to using data and artificial intelligence to create efficiencies internally. So we are not even selling those applications, but we are using them internally, right? And I think uh, the next generation of, the, of this is, is the, hey, uh, today we need to talk about large language models, right? Um, so tell us, what, how are you using those? Are you using those? Do you sit back and you're like, hey, they do my job. I don't need to do anything anymore. How does that work? It's still here. It's OK. But <laughs> maybe just before then, thinking about efficiency, one of the things I did want to talk about that I forgot to mention was that at times we did question whether we should be investing as much as we were in like this infrastructure. And just to focus on the efficiency point before we talk about whether LLMs are going to take us all out of jobs or, or whatever. Um, and I, I did question that for quite a long time. but. For me, because we had this really narrow like set of customers we could actually target, investing early up front in all of this infrastructure to truly identify the companies we could sell to was a worthwhile investment for me because for every single company I would run an ad at or send my sales team after who wasn't a software company that had a checkout, I, like, I'm never getting a return on that money because I literally can't use my product. So in investing really early in data and at the very earliest top of the funnel was in who I was actually feeding my ads and my sales efforts at, it increased the likelihood I was going to get any return on, on that investment. The better yet, with all the context that we had and the prioritization, we should, in theory, not only lower that CAC, but also improve the conversion rate at every stage in the funnel. So efficiency was something we, we thought about a lot. Um, in terms of like the more recent developments and things like uh, large language models, which have been talked about a lot, um, they're a little bit different to what we've been doing and like the natural language processing I was talking about. And I'm no expert in this. We have some very good chief product officers and CTOs at the likes of uh, Goodfit, my new company, but I'll do my best. And um, the natural language processing that we'd historically been talking about for classification is really good at looking at the immediate context that the words it's analyzing are in. Whereas LLMs, have a look, look at like large swathes of text, I guess, and have a better understanding of the context in which the words that it's analyzing are being written. I think it's sometimes called essence. Um, but interestingly, as far as I understand, they're not so good at the classification use case, which is really, was really important to Paddle, and we've since applied to identify things like fintech companies or e-commerce companies or label something as B2B or B2C. It's not actually good at that. It's much better at like a lot of the conversational use cases. Like you'll see, Chatbots are like everywhere right now, and, and they're a really great way to allow a user to interface with like a report builder, like talking to someone about the report they want to receive and interfacing with, with that individual, or the generative use cases, which are also super popular, generating things like blog, uh, blog posts. But so far, we haven't actually found a use case for the LLMs at Paddle, I don't think, um, but certainly not good fit my, my new company, largely due to some of the limitations that, that they have, to, to be honest with you. Yeah, can you tell us maybe what do you do at good fit? Because in fact, Sorry, yeah. it's exactly what we are talking about here, right? Maybe, yeah. yeah. I mean, good fit was born out of a lot of what we were doing at, at Paddle with this data. At, at some point, as I said, the investors were so intrigued by it, they kind of asked my head of RevOps to maybe go and launch his own company and apply some of these principles to other businesses, which was amazing. I was so happy for him. He's like my best friend, but I did have to find another head of RevOps, which was a nightmare. Um, but GoodFit now supplies uh, data to sales and marketing teams, um, born out of a lot of the principles that we were, we were talking about there. Um, but yeah, in terms of like limitations, I guess, and why we haven't yet used things like large language models and what we're, we're doing, I think there's a few, and again, like having ha had a walk around out there, there's probably a bunch of people who know this stuff better than me, but the ones I'm aware of, based on the use cases that we were, we were thinking about, one of the limitations for me is that it feels like the language models more broadly, to be honest, are really good at drawing insight from your existing data set. So if I have like 20 million companies in a database and I want to label which of them are B2B or B2C, it's going to be really good at that. 
uh, in the classification use case that I described. But having found those, it's not going to find me a net new 10 million other companies I could go and sell to. So they're almost quite a good way to interface or compute stuff out of an existing data set rather than finding you like net new data, if that makes any sense. It's quite difficult to explain. But the thing that's more commonly talked about are the issues around like hallucination. So because things like the large language models are trained on the, the web and thus sometimes inaccurate data or incomplete data sets, they often spit out inaccuracies or uh, sometimes can even just like contradict itself. Um, so I think this ties into some of the generative uh, use case stuff. Like ultimately, these models are only going to be as good as the data that we feed them. Um, I was at Sasta just a few days ago, and a friend of mine called G. Gaban, who ran growth at like Ramp and Gorgeous and Segment, he's really sure that um, these models are going to replace like the handwritten outbound emails that SDRs are sending today. And I kind of chatting to him about it. It's like depending on the data you feed them, like maybe, like I think we'll probably get there. But if you feed one of these models just basic like company name, industry, and employee size, the message that it's going to automatically generate is going to be, hey, you're an industry X and about the size Y, like you, you should use my product. Like it maybe replicates a really bad sales email you were sending before, but our goal isn't to replicate bad stuff, it's to do stuff slightly better. And if you fed that same model a much richer, I guess, data set, you could produce, I think, much more impactful results. So to give you an example of that, uh, I work with a company called Clary. We supply them the data at GoodFit. They do like forecasting for B2B sales teams. And if we fed them data on things like sure, industry and employee size, but also like the size of particular functions or open jobs that company has, or even all of the de job descriptions for every open job they have, they'd be able to compute programmatically much richer messaging um, as a part of their like outbound process, like using just those examples to do this on the fly. Maybe they create a message which is like, hey, I see you've got a RevOps team of five people, but your company's 500. I'm really glad there's an open job to scale that team. And within its JD, I see that you're, you want this person to roll out your first version of forecasting at company X. Here's how Clary in that example could help you do that. It's a much richer message, but it only can be produced if the thing you're actually feeding the model with is a very useful and, and rich set of data in, in the first place. And um, so the hallucination thing is, is pretty broad, broadly talked about. And just probably final question, everyone in the audience is thinking, probably I can build those efficiencies myself too. Maybe can you give just a piece of advice to anybody that is listening to this and is like, where do I start? So what are kind of the next steps, next steps for that? Mm -hmm. How would you start about that if you are the founder of a company and you, you want to start building that? Yeah, I think it's an awesome question. I think something we're actually seeing right now, which I'm not sure is necessarily positive, but people are just trying to shoehorn some of this technology into what it is that they're doing. Um, like I almost feel like we're massive laggards for not actually having implemented something like this a good fit just yet. But I think it's like any product development, right? You need to deeply understand the problem that is you're trying to solve and then think about the two tools at your disposal in order to actually go and solve that, that problem. Um, so if AI or generative AI or anything along those lines can, can go and do that, awesome. I think the, the really obvious use case is uh, a lot of the generative stuff that we, we focus on in terms of text, like producing summaries or summarizing content. If it's not necessarily customer facing, it's probably a nice place to start to actually mm -hmm. start building some efficiencies internally before you expose yourself to, to, to your market and to your customers whose experience you obviously want to protect a lot. So I'd maybe think about internal efficiency before you thought about making the, the customer's life maybe uh, any easier, probably my suggestion. Fantastic. Great. Great to understand also that we can use data, AI internally, even before we can expose the customers to all these products and to maybe the questionable um, accuracy of some of those models. I think it's good to test them uh, internally. So thank you so much, Harrison. Thank you so much, everybody. And I hope you enjoy your afternoon. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.